Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Literally, I've been impressed by the brilliance in this room for a long time from a remote and afar. So thank you uh, really for having, having us here. It's quite a privilege. Um, advance, please. So the three of us are going to speak today about uh, clean energy pathway and a future that Edison is seeing uh, come, come to light and what we want to keep pushing forward. Um, myself, Holly Hill, Will, that you all know, and then Karen Claypack. So we'll be talking about how this comes from our strategy perspective and how it trickles down through our programs and our communities. Advance, please. Uh, we're all well versed in California's emissions reduction goals, and so this is really the framework that we're, we're discussing today. Um, go ahead and advance. Uh, Edison has put forth their clean energy pathway, and what it does is it responds to the state's goals. Um, who has seen this and is familiar with it? 50-50, okay, thank you, thank you. So we wanted to take a leadership perspective in this. Um, it's, of course, been um, really controversial. We've gotten a lot of interesting feedback on it, but there are three pillars. So number one, obviously, um, cleaning our own selves and our, our infrastructure, 80% carbon-free electricity. Um, also electrifying the transportation industry. So this is light duty vehicles, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And this is a huge, obviously a huge undertaking. And we've gone to the commission for substantial funding in this arena. And then obviously efficient electrification in our um, space and water heating. So three big pillars, buildings, um, vehicles and electrification, and then our own infrastructure and providing, providing um, clean renewable energy, both to customers and communities for our service territory. Um, please advance. My, I have two hats at Edison. So number one is sustainability. The other one is philanthropy. So I'm kind of a little, a little bit of soft stuff today instead of uh, the hard technology right now. But my role is actually bringing forth. Um, go ahead to the next one too. Um, uh, what I'm responsible for is actually a 2.6 million dollar portfolio of what we give to environmental nonprofits. So really encouraging community change that aligns with our strategy and understanding how we can make a true impact and lasting change from a grassroots perspective. So in 2017 alone, Edison gave $20 million to nonprofits to really drive this change. Uh, there are four major buckets, education, environment, civic, and public safety. So my focus, again, is the environment. So everything from habitat restoration, trail restoration, climate adaptation, climate resiliency, um, anything to help communities strive and thrive uh, in the clean energy space. Advance, please. So I was tasked with this um, four months into this new position <laughs> that I acquired um, of, of actually finding those, those organizations and understanding how best to execute on this dollar, dollar value. So, it was very interesting because I was told, yeah, just send out a few emails, no problem. Just, just send out a few emails. And I, I was hearing that so much was happening across the country. You can imagine 12,000 employees. We're touching a lot of people, a lot of companies, and learning about Will's work and Karen's work. I was like, no, this can't be piecemeal. We have to do this holistically, right? So getting all the right players at the table from throughout Southern California Edison was huge, and it is huge. Um, so rather than send an email, I'm the one with all the nagging meetings because we've got to discuss who we're touching and how we can best execute on this funding. So um, number one, establishing our giving priorities. Then again, getting the business, the organizational unit alignment and making sure we're all on the same page. And then finding those, those organizations. This has been a real challenge. Who has the capacity to execute on the funding? Um, it's great to give out $2,500 grants. It's also great to give out you know, $100,000 grants. But can people take that money and really drive change with it? Or do they have the capacity? Do they have the staff? Do they have the education? Um, what, how, do, how do we really make it be in, impactful? So finding those organizations, then executing on the grant. So making sure that that grant is actually doing good, that deliverables are being met, that there's a project, that there's an, you know, an actual um, agenda, allocations are in place, we have people staffed, and we are talking with customers and community organizations. So really following that grant through execution requires a lot of handholding. And we're talking about the environment portfolio alone has over 150 grantees. And this is half of my hat. 
So this is, it's really a lot of work and you want to partner with these people. You want to ask, you know, what are you doing? How, you know, how's it going? Who are you speaking with? It's really, it's really great work. Um, so ensuring that grant execution happens is critical. And then actually tracking the effective change. So typically in the past, we've been giving up the money, but there hasn't been the full circle. You know, really what, um, what are the metrics we're collecting on that investment and how is it helping drive, drive the clean energy future? So that's the philanthropy side of the house. Will's gonna speak to how we engage with programs and then um, Karen will follow up with our customer interaction as well. So go ahead. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Just feel, feel compelled here that we uh, have our own little congregation to, uh -huh. to, uh, to ask for a zero carbon amen. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Man, that feels good. Uh, can I ask you to advance, please? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a little bit um, about the, the sort of grout of uh, investor-owned utilities, which is what brings the big pieces together. Um, so uh, we have a long, deep, rich history of, of working with our customers on actual zero net energy projects, which Robert and others and Sean can attest to. Uh, but at the end of the day, the most common message that we receive from all types of stakeholders, so we have 14 million customers, pg e has far more than that, you can imagine, uh, is that people feel overwhelmed and inundated. They want to participate, they want to do the right thing, but overwhelmingly it's, how do I start? This stuff is really confusing. It's confusing for all of us. Can you imagine the person who doesn't know what a kilowatt hour is? Um, and so what we try to do with planning and coordination, these soft, fuzzy words, is to try to listen to all of our stakeholders. This includes our regulators, the CPC, the CEC, ARB, um, experts like yourselves, but also the people, like I said, who don't know what kilowatt hours are. Uh, and some of the works that we've yielded from this type of planning and coordination are these documents here. So uh, uh, Holly just mentioned uh, the, the clean power and electrification pathway, which has been well received. But again, this is more of a regulatory and, uh, and sort of higher level uh, sort of document. Um, We've actually cut our teeth uh, on providing or generating a building energy benchmarking. So we've, we've interviewed and talked to the CEC, the Department of Energy, NREL, all the big names that you can think of to try to understand the building energy modeling space specifically and propose a cohesive uh, way forward for Edison. Uh, and that was done in 2016. That's a public free document for everybody to see that says, hey, we want open source software we want to streamline compliance. We want a single model. We don't want 18 models uh, to be able to do incentives, compliance, and design. Uh, so all that's sort of in there and give us sort of some, some technical legs. Uh, and then just recently, uh, Anne, uh, as well as EMI Consulting, helped us re-envision what our customer relationship should be. Yes, we have a suite of programs, and so do the other IOUs. Uh, that have historically been stacked on each other because we thought, hey, EE was a good idea, and then DG was a good idea, and then DR, and all the acronyms you can think of. And now we're in this gigantic mess. And we're saying, okay, let's rethink this. Let's, let's swipe this to the side, and let's re-envision this from the customer back and see what that looks like and what kind of program that ends us up with, with a, with a clean slate. Uh, so we just finished that about a month ago, with uh, thanks to, to Anne. Uh, it then talks a lot about uh, this concept of prosumers. Um, so instead of looking at our customers as, as, as passive consumers, we're saying, how do we enable all customers, not just us uh, bright people in the room, to act as grid assets? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, advance, please. I forgot this doesn't work. All right. So sorry to confuse everybody. This is just a snapshot of what some of that logic looks like. This is taking uh, the customer's perspective. Again, we have 14 million customers and trying to reverse engineer how do we meet everybody's objectives all in one framework? So we started out by doing a residential new construction program. It has since expanded to be residential plus existing. And it's very clear that this sort of framework would be applicable to all buildings, which is great. Then there's no confusion about who to go for what, how to do what, and all this stuff. And so the framework that we're proposing, and we're, we're sort of mid-development of this program called Clean Energy Homes, is to leverage the advanced metering infrastructure that already exists on the homes 
and customers are all defaulted to that in California, in, in IOU territory, and convert it using hourly site to source factors to come up with carbon budgets. That carbon budget is then compared against uh, a database of, of uh, carbon benchmarks or baselines in the green there, which we are also in the process of developing uh, as test cases with the, with the CEC and others. Uh, and then, uh, not to forget the two other important part that the CEC highly focused on yesterday, which are uh, the grid harmonization piece. So that's primarily a locational issue. Depending on where your home or that asset is, it's going to have a different impact on the grid and our local distribution and transmission infrastructure. And then also the huge one that keeps getting left off the table, which is demographics, right? This should be a weighted program. You should get more if you're in a disadvantaged community or a low-income community. Uh, and so we have these sort of levers here layered on top of each other that would be transparent to everybody or completely masked uh, depending on how much interest you have to generate performance-based greenhouse gas incentives. Yes, Nima. It, it, so in other words, if you're a really low-income household mm -hmm. in a moderate to high-income neighborhood, it doesn't count. No, it, it should also. So, we, so right now, we have low-income programs that we have to figure out how to back out of that so we don't double pay for low-income. But if, uh, ideally, that demographic factor will include low-income and, and also uh, disadvantaged communities. Uh, but yeah, there are some reference data sets here that we are actually pulling from. And where we didn't have them, we actually created them. Ton of work uh, involved in this with the NVGL. Yes, sir. The disadvantaged use criteria, which is I think it's based on like OEHA uh, mm -hmm. criteria, I don't think that includes urban heat islands or heat wave impacts or anything like that. Okay. All it has is like air conditioning stations. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> are you thinking of looking at that where homes are going to have a much bigger cooling demand during those severe periods? We can certainly look at it. I know that the the, um, the 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 time variable that you you presented on yesterday is definitely not in the the uh, the Cal Enviro screen data, but there is a lot of other stuff. Um, there is environmental air quality, um, PM two point five, for example. Um, but yeah, that's 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 an area of growth for sure. Oh, good point. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we advance to the next, uh, my last slide? Um, so this is an eyesore, but it has a lot of information that shows how, uh, hopefully, that we bridge the gap between new construction and existing. Um, our, our interviews with our customers and the general public indicate that's just a, this new construction versus existing is a manif manifestation of our own creating. People don't really think about that. People don't care about it. Uh, so what we're trying to do is develop a program that encompasses both seamlessly and we do that by, again, comparing somebody's baseline carbon budget against their designed performance in an energy model, just like we do now. That would give you the year one incentive using the same uh, ben uh, benchmark or baseline that occupant of the same building would get a monthly bill credit in an ongoing way as a 30-year asset. Um, so that would be, in this case, uh, in the amount of $25 a month. And they'd simply say, do they want to enroll or not? And they would show up on their bill. Um, There's a performance incentive ongoing, your last bullet there, yep. for ongoing conservation of carbon dioxide that gives them up to like a $25 a month benefit mm -hmm. if they stay frugal, essentially. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Um, you're assuming that the uh, societal cost of carbon is at $200 per metric ton? In this in this example, yeah, but it's going to change. So there's a, there's a current cap a ceiling cap right now that the CPC our regulators think is is reasonable. That's about eighty five dollars or so, or eighty seven dollars. Somebody might correct me in here. Um, but we're also taking into account okay, how much do we actually use to operate current EE programs and other programs? There is some sort of uh, investment for the return based on uh, operational program development. So this is saying, hey, if we reduce the overall overhead of operating an, uh, a program, then you can up the cost of actual incentive. Um, and so this is going to be intended to be operating outside of our energy efficiency proceeding, if you guys speak regulatory speak, 
This is not going to be under the three prong or any of that sort of thing. We're, we're looking at non-traditional incentive means uh, to operate this program. Uh, well, lots of questions, but I also, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll pause there. And then, <laughs> Next slide, please. So I'm Karen Klepak. Uh, I'm the senior advisor for new construction at Edison. I'm the customer facing rep for uh, developers. So I work with all of our home builders and commercial developers across our service territory. So I kind of hear it all. If you have complaints about your planner not calling you back, then they can call me. If you have questions about our, your, our programs, you can call me. Solar interconnections. Uh, easements, real properties. Um, I'm kind of just the customer resource, help them navigate the company and herd the cats. Um, so this is, I'm just going to give a couple examples here, some case study projects that we have. Um, the first, and this is um, an EPIC funded project, it's with Meritage. So a few years ago we did the um, Sierra Crest project in Fontana that was ZNE. It was about 20 homes. I think half of them had batteries and half didn't. Um, this one is in Irvine. It's right by John Wayne Airport. Um, EPRI is working on this one as well. And this is all electric zero net energy and it's multifamily. And it's on a, a really small, it's in an industrial area that's probably gonna be uh, transforming into residential over the years. So um, it was uh, a big building that had luxury car storage. So it was a bunch of Maseratis in a big empty room. Um, and they tore that down and now they're, they're building this multifamily community. So it's gonna be 44 condos. Um, they're not putting, they're not bringing gas into the sight line at all. I think the city's requiring them to bring it up to the sight line, <laughs> but um, they're not running it within the, the community at all. Uh, next slide. Uh, so they're going to have 4KW of solar per unit. That's what, uh, according to CBEC Res, I think Biop showed a little bit less, but uh, for compliance, they're going to do 4KW per unit. Um, it's going to be on our uh, virtual net metering tariff, which means it's just a big array that feeds um, into the grid, and then it's essentially an accounting exercise on our side. So then we allocate the, the benefits to the customers um, on our side. EPRI uh, is reimbursing Meritage, 10000 per home. I think we're giving some money from our emerging products group for the technologies as well. Uh, and then we'll be doing um, monitoring after the fact for two years. Um, I'm also working with Meritage's uh, director of marketing. They, just like in their Fontana project, they'll have next to the sales office a room that has some demonstrations of air leakage and the technologies and things. Um, so that's a, a place where there's a photo of the one in Fontana. So it's a place where the potential buyers can come in and see it and touch it, and uh, we'll be able to do some marketing there as well. So they're gonna start, um, it, it, they just recently started vertical construction on it, and they're gonna start this fall uh, doing some sessions with the public. Next slide. So this one, um, this is kind of my baby <laughs> lately. Um, this is a project, so I, I'm on the uh, BIA Board of Directors at Baldy View. Last year at PCBC, I ran into um, Ray Osborne, who was heading up, he's kind of transitioning off, but he was heading up Homemade uh, Inland Empire chapter. Homemade uh, is a homeless nonprofit, um, and they build shelters in our territory. Um, it's also kind of the, the pet nonprofit of the Building Industry Association, so a lot of the home builders do work with them. Um, I ran into Ray and I said, you know, we really need to partner on a project together. So um, after the conference, we came back and we had a meeting and we settled on this one. Uh, this is Mary's Village in San Bernardino. San Bernardino, more than half of the residents are on welfare, food stamps, or some kind of combination. Um, 30, it's the second poorest large city in the country next to Detroit, which is where I'm from. Um, <laughs> and uh, San Bernardino houses 10% of the county's population, but 40% of, um, of the county's homeless, and 70% of those are male. So there's definitely a big need in the area for these types of um, transitional living projects. So the city did not want another soup kitchen where people kind of come in on an emergency basis. This is a men's facility that will be 18 months to two years uh, transitional living. If we can go to the next slide. So um, it, there's four different phases to it. Um, the later phases will have some non-residential uses, but the first phase here, um, it's uh, basically four large homes it's a quad of, of four large homes. Thank you. Um, and this will be uh, where the men come in um, and they start out in group living and then they have services available to them as well. Um, you can see that it's located in the 
reddest of the red uh, disadvantaged community per Cal Enviro screen. Next slide. So uh, phase, there's four buildings, like I said. In the first two buildings, it'll be 12 men per room, so group living. Uh, then they kind of graduate to three men per room. Then they get independent living. And like I said, at the end of 18 months or so, they'll be out on their own. Um, in conjunction, there's mental health services, drug and alcohol rehabilitation, learn life skills like budgeting and parenting and hygiene. Um, there's education. And then they also have um, big kitchens, but they have to cook for themselves. They do the laundry for themselves. Um, and then uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, there's also a transitional age youth program that I'm working with Holly on as well. Um, so my job with our customers is to help them make sure that they're leveraging all the programs and services that are available to them from Edison. So for this project, um, we went to the Sustainable Communities Program. Um, to, that program provides technical services but does not pay for hard costs. So, uh, we were able to do the analysis to make recommendations. We, we gave them a couple different options. We gave them a dual fuel z &E option. We gave them an all electric option. They opted for the all electric option. Um, and then their contractors gave us incremental costs. So um, the total per building was 160, multiply that, um, I'm sorry, total for one building is 40, multiply that by four for the four buildings. And then we're gonna do M and V for one of the buildings. So, um, our emerging products group, which does pay the hard costs for technologies, they're going to be uh, reimbursing the developer $260,000 for the incremental costs. Um, that goes to Crestwood. So Crestwood Communities is a local home builder. Um, Homemade does not actually build any buildings. They're the nonprofit, but then they partner with a builder who does the construction. So Crestwood, we're working with Crestwood on the recommendations and the reimbursement on the uh, incremental costs. And if you can go to the next slide. Um, I also knocked on Holly's door and I said, Holly, what you got? How much money do you have? So, um, so I'm working with Holly and our corporate philanthropy group on a transitional age youth program as well. And this pro Holly's program does go to the nonprofit. So this would go directly to homemade. And this is a transitional age youth program. It's construction job skills training for 18 to 22 year olds. A lot of the guys here are each out of the foster care system and were put out on the streets. Um, so this would be training them in um, construction, solar installation, green jobs, and things like that. And I think that's the last slide. Is there another one? Oh, uh, just really quickly. <laughs> this is um, our high performance walls and attics display at our Energy Education Center in Irwindale. So I don't know, maybe some of you have been there, but it has pull out sections that shows different framing and insulation techniques and air sealing techniques to uh, meet or exceed 2019 Title 24. So we had our ribbon cutting there. These are two of our VPs along with the two head guys at the BIA Southern California. And that's our last slide. <laughs>